Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We join you today from the banks of the Arkansas River in Tulsa, where the effects of lingering drought can definitely be seen. And drought is one of many topics being discussed at this year's Governor's Water Conference. The packed house at the governor's 33rd annual water conference and research symposium proves water is indeed a hot topic in Oklahoma. Water by its very nature will increase in attention every year. And with back-to-back -back drought years, a growing concern. That's why research from across the state is so valuable. It's important for scientists to gather together like this, to talk about those issues, to share research data, so that we are all uh, on the cutting edge of knowledge because it's going to be the science that will make a difference in the future, in Oklahoma's water future. Equally important, water policy and planning ahead. Probably the most valuable thing that we've learned is um, really kind of what folks think about the water issues and, and we have, depending on whether you're in the Panhandle versus uh, McCurtain County, Southeast Oklahoma, you have a lot of different needs and values for water. Uh, and, and so it's important for us to be able to bring those people together, talk about what's going on in water regulation and water science and technology, uh, that sort of thing. But most importantly, uh, how it impacts these Oklahomans that are out there on the landscape, putting that water to work uh, for uh, the growth of our state, for the growth of our families, ag industry, and all the other industries that are bustling out there. The 2012 drought loss estimates as they relate to agriculture were released at the Governor's Water Conference. Joining us now is Dave Scheidler, our Community Development Specialist. And Dave, you put those numbers together. What did you find this year? So we found that the total impact was about $426 million. Uh, a little more than half of that was crop-related losses. Uh, another third of that roughly was livestock losses. And then the remainder were a combination of municipal uh, costs that were incurred related to drought stress landscapes uh, and then wildfire impacts. Okay, and looking at these numbers last year significantly more, give us that picture and kind of what's different this year. Sure, so this year's estimates are about a fourth of what they were last year. So last year we had about $1.6 billion worth of impacts. Um, and this year again, a little more than 400 million, so about a quarter. Um, <clears throat> the difference between the two years is twofold. One is last year, all the livestock losses for the most part were incurred. So uh, a lot of farmers and ranchers liquidated their herds and so that put a lot less stress in terms of needs for supplemental feeds and extra hay uh, to feed the, uh, the herds. But then also we had, um, there were additional herds or additional cattle to cull from the herds. So the farmers that, that had the cattle, kept the cattle, didn't add or take away from their existing herds at this point. So, so that was part of the story. The other part of the story is the real impacts of this year's drought, it's what's termed a flash drought. So it was a very intense but short period of time. It occurred after we got the wheat harvest out um, <clears throat> and really only impacted our, our double crops uh, those crops that we put in as a double crop. So um, <clears throat> early soybeans, corn, and wheat, we were able to harvest, um, but those crops that were still on the ground or, or were looking to mature in the uh, July, August timeframe were the ones that we really lost. And so um, given that it was that just short duration of, a, of an impact meant we didn't lose our entire crop like we did last year. Okay. Two years though, over $2 billion of agricultural losses specifically, but that of course has a ripple effect. Talk Absolutely. about that. So we mentioned um, as part of our drought estimates this year that you know we're beginning to capture additional costs to municipalities, for example. Um, the wildfires themselves put extra burden on rural and municipal fire departments. Uh, as one example. But <clears throat> we also know that uh, as farmers are beginning to anticipate continued drought, that they're changing their management practices, which means um, they're varying their input purchases, um, <clears throat> but then also um, how they go about mitigating that risk has impacts for farm income, um, which in turn has impacts for consumption spending uh, in the communities. And so um, those combination of things, we're, we're trying to get uh, a better handle on and try to anticipate what those are gonna look like in the future. 
we talk about drought almost every week on SUNUP. It's not going away anytime soon. We're getting ready to enter what looks to be a third year of drought in a row. Right. Serious impact also on the cotton crop and sort of the ripple effect in the southwest part of the state. Absolutely. So uh, this year there was uh, no planting actually down, uh, particularly in the, the Lugus <clears throat> Luger Altus uh, irrigation district because they just didn't have the water um, to irrigate. And so <clears throat> there's um, farmers are beginning to wonder um, should they consider planting other crops and, and that obviously will have some pretty big impacts in terms of the value added processing of that cotton in that region as well. Now that you have the information, these numbers that you put together, how do you and the folks in Extension address drought for the people of Oklahoma? Sure, so uh, we've got a couple of things uh, that we're looking to do. Um, certainly our uh, livestock and crop specialists have uh, uh, developed some and are continuing to develop materials on how to manage in the midst of a drought, um, how to plan uh, for future uh, scenarios of drought. Um, a new product that was just released this past fall was how to rebuild your, rebuild your herd in the midst of drought. Um, so that's one new product that folks should be looking for. Um, we're also beginning to develop some materials for municipal water managers uh, as well um, and helping them understand um, what are the most effective conservation techniques um, since uh, municipal water use during the summertime is 60 to 70 percent of it is just residential use. Um, primarily that's water in people's lawns and so uh, how can those municipal water managers best reduce that water use. Um, we also have uh, some discussions. We're trying to put together some conversations around long-term policy. Um, what, what needs to be in place to help uh, mitigate some of the effects, but also help Oklahoma households um, be better prepared for uh, these kind of severe drought situations. Okay, good advice. Thanks for running the numbers. And of course, we'll be talking to you again in 2013, I'm sure. Sounds great. Okay, Dave Scheidler, our Community Development Specialist. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Without meaningful moisture, winter is the time of year when Oklahoma's fire risk can really climb. Freezes have knocked out the summer foliage, and when that foliage is dry, it can easily burn. A burning index map from 3 o'clock Wednesday afternoon has much of the state colored orange or red. Conditions in those bright red areas are severe enough that if a fire broke out, the flames along the fire front would be eight feet or higher. The Keech Byram drought index values climbed again this week. A map from Wednesday did not have any locations below 200. Six mesonet sites were above 700. 800 is maximum dryness. The majority of locations were colored red and very dry, falling between 550 and 650. Tuesday morning was a cold one. Bristow was the coldest spot at 7 degrees. The far-flung mesonet sites at Oak Mulgee, Tallahena, Centrahoma, Bernieville, and Kenton all recorded 9 degrees. The warmest temperatures were still cold ones. Those were the 25-degree temperatures at Woodward and Eric. We hope some of you folks ended this week just a little wetter. Gary, what do you have for us today? Good morning. Hopefully by the time you're seeing this, you've received some rainfall. It would certainly be a nice early Christmas present. And for another nice early Christmas present, I'm going to show you four drought maps today that sort of categorize where we've been over the last couple of years, maybe even a little bit farther back. So let's get started with this week's map. First, with this week's map, we see basically the same depiction we've seen from the U.S. Drought Monitor over the last two or three weeks, except we've had a little bit of an expansion of that severe drought in northeastern Oklahoma. So our last little stand of moderate drought is now gone from the state, and we're now 100% complete in at least severe drought across the state. After that lump of coal, how about a little bit of perspective? Take Texas County out in the Oklahoma Panhandle. That's the middle county. 
That county has been in at least extreme drought, that's the red color on the drought monitor map, for 604 consecutive days. You can take a look at the map from that period, the first time they had seen that extreme drought, April 19, 2011. So it's been a long haul for those folks out there. Now some part of the state has been in at least moderate drought, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor, for 779 consecutive days. This is a look at the map from the last time we had no moderate drought in Oklahoma. All we had was some abnormally dry conditions. That's from October 26, 2010. To kick it down a notch, when was the last time Oklahoma had a completely color-free drought map? That's with even those abnormally dry conditions that appear yellow on the map. Well, that's been 933 consecutive days dating back to May 25th of 2010. So it's been quite a while since we've had close to normal conditions over the entire state. I think a nice present would be a good dose of moisture, even on Christmas Day. And I don't care if it's frozen or liquid, we'll take anything we can get. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist, joins us now. And Kim, those latest WASD numbers have been released. We have both bulls and bears this time around. Let's start off talking about the bulls. Well, the soybeans and the corn uh, reports were neutral to, to uh, bullish. Uh, you look at corn, uh, the ending stocks estimate came in as the same as it was last month, but below uh, the market expectations. With the beans, uh, the estimate was uh, 10 million below last month, but again, it was exactly what the market expected in the United States. If you look at the world any stocks numbers, the, the corn number uh, was slightly less than the market had expected, bullish in this case, and the beans were almost exactly what the market e expected. So what you had with the, the, with the corn and the beans was a slightly neutral to bullish, bullish report. And so then in terms of wheat, that's where the bears are. Uh, the bears took control over after that, that report. The report showed what we've been talking about for the last couple months is that there is, there is adequate wheat. There's, we got sufficient amounts of wheat in the bin. You look at those uh, wheat numbers with the United States, uh, 704 million for the November report, 754 million. The five-year average is 708. So we now have above the five-year average uh, stocks are ending stocks uh, for wheat. If you look at the world, uh, they increased it to 6.5 billion bushels from uh, 6.4 billion. Again, and that 6.5 is exactly the market average. Okay, and how did the markets then react to all of this news? Well, you'd expect corn and beans slightly lower because of the wheat, but wheat was down 27 cents and below that uh, $8.82 uh, support level for the March contract. And then where do you think the market is headed from here now? If that wheat price stays below that uh, $8.82, then I think we could get another $0.75 cents down. I don't really expect it to go down uh, that far, but it's definitely possible and unless the drought holds it up. Okay, and finally, with all this in mind, advice for producers. If they're holding wheat, they're going to have to hold it out to February to March to try to get anything with $0.50 cents risk premium in it. Okay, Kim, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Last week on the Cow-Calf Corner, we visited with you about preparing for the upcoming spring calving season, checking the equipment, and having a calving kit already put together. One of the things that we mentioned at that time was to have a protocol so that everyone in the operation, in the family, the hired help, would have a good idea of what to do if they're the ones present uh, when a cow or heifer needs some assistance. Part of that protocol should be proper placement of the obstetrical chains on that baby calf's feet so that uh, when pressure is applied, we're doing the most good and the least amount of potential harm. As you look on this particular graphic, you'll see what I think are the proper way to put on obstetrical chains. And that is to put a loop above the fetlock, then bring the chain down below the fetlock between the ankle and the hoof, and then put a half hitch on that chain in such a manner that the chain then comes out over the toes of that baby calf. 
If we're applying the chains while the, the calves' feet are still basically inside the cow or the heifer, this way when we're pulling and applying pressure, we're pulling those very, very sharp edges away from the soft tissue of the, of the mother. And in this way, we're less likely to cause some tearing and some damage that, that could be a real problem for her later on. So knowing how to put those obstetrical chains on before we start pulling and doing it correctly, I think is really, really important. And everyone that uh, is going to be helping should know that procedure. If you'd like to learn just a little bit more about working with cows and heifers at calving time, I encourage you to go to the SUNUP website and download the extension circular. It's ANSI 1006. It's called Calving Time Management for cows and heifers. And it's got a whole lot of information about working with these cattle that need some assistance at calving time so that we save the maximum amount of calves and have them, have them available to sell next year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. One of the topics discussed quite a bit at the Governor's Water Conference was Eastern Red Cedar. Joining us now is Larry Sanders, our Ag Policy Specialist. And Larry, get everybody up to speed on how we got where we're at right now in terms of Eastern Red Cedar. Well, Lindell, you know, this was one of those classic cases of good intentions gone awry. We brought the Red Cedar in for very good reasons because it was rapid growing and we needed something for windbreaks in the last century. and. Uh, it's become what most people probably consider one of our most serious invasive species problems now. Uh, the latest estimates suggest we may have as many as 8 million acres in the state infested and uh, it could take $400 million in initial treatment to resolve the basic problem and maybe $30 million a year in maintenance. So. Uh, this is something that many people in the state uh, desperately want to find a solution to. And of course addressing policy may be a potential way to do that. As, you, as folks start to do that, do they look at the costs and the benefits then? Oh no doubt and there are people on both sides of this issue. You know there are some people who see uh, this as a potential benefit uh, for value added because it, it's uh, renewable energy potential. You can get aromatic oils, uh, construction materials, uh, mulch, uh, uh, habitat windbreak still for some people. But on the other side, this is probably one of the most serious extreme fire dangers that we have in the state as we saw this past fire season. Uh, it takes away opportunities for owners on what they can do with managing their land. It reduces the wealth base in both the public and private sectors. Uh, so it has uh, quite a bit of serious cost in, involved with it. We've talked a lot about the different aspects of Eastern Red Cedar on SUNUP. From a policy point of view, what do we do now? Well, there are some people who want to go straight to finding a policy solution, and we do have interim studies underway. There will be legislation proposed again in the state legislature for this. But uh, from my perspective, there's some very basic questions we need to answer before we get to that final point. One is, what is success? Some people would say eradicate it, get completely rid of it in the state. Some people say let's try to find a way to balance it uh, so that we can get some of those potential benefits out of it while reducing the cost to, to so many landowners. And some people say, well, we really can't talk about eradication at this point. We probably just need to talk about managing it. So if we do that, then we need to decide do we want to have voluntary or mandatory solutions? How much of the state and federal resources do we want to have thrown at this problem? And those are pretty basic questions that we need to get resolved before we get to the point of saying this is what the state has determined needs to be done. Okay, a lot of analysis. Keep us posted from a policy standpoint. The issue's not going to go away, is it? It's not going to go away in any time soon, I don't think. Okay, Larry Sanders, our Ag Policy Specialist. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about flaring pipe and uh, tubing and, and some of the different ways that you can do that. Yeah, you've got the regular flare, which you see quite a bit, but we're going to show you how to do a double flare as well uh, that you might see on, for example, a brake line. 
So the first thing, you know, when you, when you, uh, you put your pipe uh, or your tubing inside your, uh, your clamp, you want to have it at the right depth using your, uh, your gauge on the, the piece here and pulling it together. I in the right one. Is that quarter inch? Mm -hmm. One tip, you know, if, we, if we're using copper, the copper will hold in here pretty easily and you can get a pretty good grip on it with, uh, with your clamps here. But if you've got something, some steel tubing that you're trying to flare, it's a, it's a lot harder to grab that and hold it in place. And a lot of times we'll see uh, somebody will grab these with the channel locks and start to tighten it up and then you break them off. Probably the best thing to do is just to clamp this piece in your vise on your workbench. So you can take this, clamp it in the vise, and then you'll get a really good bite on it uh, that way. Okay, once you've got that set, and, and if you've got a double flaring tool, it's going to have this little die set with it. And you set that like Randy did, and you just turn it upside down, and then take your tool. And I need more hands. There we go. Make sure it's locked in place. Spin it till your tool seats on the on the main bar here. Back it off. Then you'll remove that little insert and you'll come back to it. Finish flaring it and then that's called a double flare. Now the thing that your, uh, your tool is doing for you here is taking that edge of your pipe on your, on your tubing and it's just rolling it to the inside a little bit so that when you come back and, uh, and flare it with the other piece then it's, it's kind of curling that lip over and pushing it back out. And then you, if you're not going to do the double flare way, you can do the single flare, which there's an example of yet. You can see that it's not near as thick. This has a little more thickness to it than, than a single flare. This would be used on something like most gas lines and whatnot. So there's some tips on flaring tubing. We'll see you next week on Shop Stop. Finally today, here at SUNUP we have the good fortune of traveling the state of Oklahoma and learning some really interesting things and meeting some new friends along the way. Here with one of those stops is SUNUP's Dave Deacon. She failed. East of Antlers, we met retired ag teacher Bryant Rickman, his friend Francine Locke Bray, and Going Streak, leader of this band of Choctaw ponies. They were brought to Oklahoma, this area of Oklahoma, at the time of the Choctaw removal in the 1830s. We have records showing them coming with certain families. The Choctaw families really kept them secluded and bred them to keep them pure. And they are um, considered the purest free roaming Spanish Mustang in the country. Well, we refer to them as uh, the Spanish Mustangs uh, that's with a capital S and a capital P. It's not, not anything to do with BLM while running Mustangs. The horses are smaller than most than we see across the state, but Bryant says height can be deceptive. They set themselves apart from other horses uh, for, by their stamina, um, their endurance, their alertness. They're just really, really quick thinkers. Most people go around them because they're too, they think they're too small. But if they think back, their forefathers, this is the horses that we all used. And, and they did whatever was necessary with them. If it was catching a big bull or a big cow or yearling or whatever, they roped it and they, they did it. The light horsemen of the Choctaw Nation, they rode them for hundreds of miles. You know, and nothing to ride them 100 miles in a day's time. Uh, my son has rode several hundred mile AERC endurance races. and on these, uh, one time running from Carson City, Nevada to Sacramento, California in 32 hours. That was 200 miles. And uh, the only one that made it all on the same horse, you know. And so they, they're very deceiving as far as their looks and what they can do. A piece of history with underestimated strength and ability to persevere, built right into its DNA. 
These horses make for pretty fine Okies. That does it for us this week. Remember, you can see us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. From the banks of the Arkansas River in Tulsa, I'm Lyndall Stout. We'll see you next time at SUNUP. Be sure to join us next week on SUNUP as we celebrate the holidays with a look back at some of our favorite moments from 2012. Stretch it out out of his way, okay. and they the one that puts it on the truck, and they take it to the mill. The tracks Something average with about... cattle, it's usually somebody over 40, most all the accidents, because they cannot get away fast enough. I'm older myself now. I can't jump up on the fences the way I used to be able to do things. And a few, probably again, best forgotten. Markets is Kim Anderson. I Who saw help. a plane I behind us? I couldn't help it. <laughs> I don't know why I've started this thing here the last few times. I wind up with my hands up here like I'm a little kid waiting <laughs> for you're waiting for my next bowl of cereal or something. <laughs> you know, it's like I don't understand what the deal is. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about concrete reinforcement. So what is concrete reinforcement? You're doing a really good job. <laughs> Am I reinforcing <laughs> you well? Yes. <laughs> We're all just kind of sitting on a precipice of uh, what's going to happen next, both in the economy and beyond that. Then, on December 29th, economist Larry Sanders, Kim Anderson, and Daryl Peel. Join us for a look back at 2012 and ahead at 2013. We set a new record in 2011 for beef exports, and we're going to be down a little bit from that this year. All coming up on SUNUP.